It's a bit daunting speaking in front of a group of people, especially when I don't think I've spoken to many people face to face for the last two and a half years, and you get quite out of practice with this. Next slide. So the pandemic, we can't have a conversation about recapping uh, a little of what happened and what happened behind the scenes. I know some of you have a lot of um, big scale experience and you would have had some idea or you would have been working with us and you had a very detailed idea on what we face behind the scenes. So just recapping some of the numbers that we saw in the peak. 187,000 concurrent users at a time. Um, 100,000 pages a minute being accessed and 2 billion server hits that month. Um, these were numbers we had, we had thought we might get to in about 8 to 10 years time. And I can tell you that the day that started, somebody was on Google Analytics and said something's happening on the platform as the numbers started to rise. And the first thing we thought was it could be a DDoS. And the second thing we thought was that Google Analytics was broken um, because we didn't believe what we were seeing. And it just kept going. So I just want to tell you just a tiny bit about what that means. But any time you run a big complex platform like this, you've got a backlog and on that backlog there's hundreds and hundreds of items of things that could be slightly better. They're not really affecting your day-to-day -day life, but they'd be nice to fix, right? One day. But when you get that, when that happens, suddenly every single one of those things needs to be fixed and need to be fixed right now because you're trying to uh, deal with a scale. So for about three months, my team, Salsa, um, Amazie, and I've got to say a big thank you also to Akamai and AWS, a lot of people who sent their best engineers to help us um, work through that backlog and stabilise everything and we're extremely grateful that we got through. So what's happening now, what you can't see is where we came from, so it was about down here somewhere. So we had this big spike and it's come back, but at this stage, um, nowhere near the level it was before the pandemic. So what that's telling us is a lot of people have changed their behaviour and they're now accessing information and services for government um, online, perhaps a big cohort of people who weren't doing that earlier. Um, it's been relentless right through, and one of the reasons that we've been rather quiet is after that first stage of stabilisation and making sure we could cope with that spike, um, immense pressure on us to stay up because the consequences of us going down while carrying most of the nation's information on COVID, on our later on vaccines, um, means that uh, the huge personal responsibility uh, of the consequences of having an outage that could perhaps prevent people from getting critical information at the right time to make decisions that in the end can save their lives. So it's a, both an immense privilege as a public servant to be working at a time like this and also an immense um, pressure. So after the initial phase, of course, many um, government websites that weren't on GovCMS weren't coping too well if they had COVID information. And some of them had to build rather quickly um, that information on brand new GovCMS sites. Some of them were built in less than 24 hours and we were very heavily involved in that. Also, as each wave of information went out, Sometimes an agency was tasked with quite mammoth uh, content tasks on a team of two and a half people. And so that surge capacity they've always talked about having in GovCMS started to work. We were able to uh, share people around and move resources around to where whatever was emerging at the time and support people so that nobody was left alone, and everybody was supported. And that was the vision in the beginning of GovCMS. So I'm really um, thankful that that ended up being how it happened. <laughs> so 
So obviously a lot of the work that we had already flagged we wanted to do, we talked about DXP in 2019. Um, we were, intent was to do it in 2020 and of course a lot of our non-essential work had to stop immediately. Um, we did do some things, so we had our usual um, business as usual load, we had the pandemic load and we did some projects. So we moved from OpenShift to EKS on Amazon, it's quite a big undertaking with the amount of sites we're carrying. Um, Doug, who spoke yesterday, spoke about Akamai Purge service that we created to put the ability to purge um, back in the hands of our users. And we moved, I don't remember the number, but a lot of Drupal 8 sites to Drupal 9. And we started assisting other agencies to prepare to move from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9 this year. So quite a lot of work. Um, about three months ago, we decided to step out from under that weight and get back onto our roadmap and get back onto the vision that we had for this platform and the service. And we took the first steps in doing that by putting it out in an EOI for um, digital experience platform tools. And a number of other projects have also kicked off behind the scenes, which I'll talk about shortly. So we have messages, we're back, and um, not only are we back, but we're really pleased to be back here and to see so many colleagues and, um, uh, you know, people that we've met along the journey on Drupal, and it's been lovely to see so many people you know, face to face and be able to talk. So the journey, I, I do want to spend a little bit of time on this because I think it's really important that you understand where we're trying to go and why we're trying to go there. The end goal, enabling complex user journeys. Right, so when we talk about that, people think life events, that would be a simple user journey. <laughs> but the problem is, life events are about everybody and they're actually no single person at all. Because all of us have multiple complexities at the time that we're interacting with government. And the way that I use the example is pregnancy. For sure the pregnancy life event fits pregnant people, but um, when you're pregnant, you're normally other things as well. And my goal is that we put the pieces in place so that eventually, if I find out I'm pregnant, my relationship's just broken down. And by the way, I'm in my second year of a degree. We can actually deliver a complex universe, user journey that brings together um, personalization across many facets of somebody's life all at once. So we can't do that now, but we're trying to put the pieces in bit at a time um, so that it, this is possible. And it might take two years, it might take five, it might even take ten, but the point is if we don't know where we're going, we'll never get there at all. Making content shareable and reusable, but we already do syndication in in the SAS platform. Um, Public Defence has been doing that on, on SAS since 2016. But what we're um, thinking of is much, much more sophistication around this. And what are we trying to solve here? We're trying to solve the fact that in government, there's always many, many different agencies that talk about the same topic to their customers. And this is at the heart of why we deliver an inconsistent um, an inconsistent view to the citizens who are accessing that information. It's not done on purpose, um, but one of the really good examples I've used before is childcare. Services Australia, responsible for childcare, responsible for the transaction side of that, responsible and bears the cost. <coughs> okay, And that cost differs greatly whether people do something in a digital manner, whether they ring up on the phone or whether they go into the office. So we have Services Australia that has invested quite a lot of money and time and resource into trying to move people through digital pathways. But then, when we came to childcare, we found seven other areas of government that also touched on childcare. Different facets, it could be Aboriginal Torres Strait Island programs, it could be teen parents keeping them in school, it could be the education aspects of childcare. But what all of these different parts of um, websites that spoke about childcare 
what we found in our research was all of them wrote about their bit and then they took Services Australia's content, bits of it, and they cut and pasted that in a point of time and they added it to theirs. And can you guess what they did at the bottom of the page? They, blast, they plastered Services Australia phone number at the bottom of these pages. Every single one of them did that. That just undid all of that digital transformation work that Services Australia had done. So our vision is we can get these content snippets and we can put them in a central repository and allow people to draw from that and they're always drawing what is current. And then we're also allowing them to draw the, care the carefully crafted messages about how to go through that digital journey. So we're not doing that clustering that phone number. So this is why it's important. Next Enabling third party content delivery. Bit of a dream of mine that we get to this point. I think there's been an arrogance, or maybe just not enough thinking, about uh, where we deliver government messages and information. And there's been always a thought that we have government websites and that's where we put our information. The question for me is, is that where people are? And, the, and I believe it's not where they always are. Um, and, and, and so I'm not alarming anybody. I, I'm not proposing that we get rid of government websites because I have found in my research that um, even if people find out about something external to government, they come back to government to check it's the authoritative source. So it's really important that we continue to publish on government websites. However, a good example, pregnancy. Now, I know there's a lot of blokes in the room, and I know you won't personally experience pregnancy, but you've got mothers, you've got sisters and partners and friends, so I hope this journey won't be too alien to you. And I have spoken about this before, so I apologise if I'm boring anyone. So, what do people do when they find out they're pregnant? A little line comes up on the thing. Well, I can tell you the first thing that comes into their head is not, oh my God, I'm pregnant, I must go to a government website. It just doesn't happen like that in life. But guess what? In government, there are key messages that we need to get to that woman at that point in time, that week. Right? We need to get messages about folic acid and supplementation immediately. By three months, we need to be engaging with them to make sure that they they have a leave maternity care. By five months, we need to make sure they're booked into a hospital. And then there's all the other things that go on in government around health, um, around preparation, around the workforce, that we need to message and make sure that people are aware of, their, of, um, of what's available to them, or aware of any obligations. But if you're a working woman, <clears throat> maybe you don't engage with government until you're seven months pregnant by choice, you know, come by choice, and it's because you want to find out about virginity. Therefore, where are people, where are the people that are pregnant? Oh my God, I'm pregnant. I must go to baby.com or, you know, babycenter.com.au. And what I want to know is, where's my, when's my due date? And what's my fetus doing? How many millimetres is it this week? And what's it doing? What's it doing in there? That's what that's how people who are pregnant are actually doing on the internet. So what if we can deliver our content um, and allow the private sector to take that content that is authoritative and deliver it to the places where people actually are? So that's the vision. Now I know there's lots of things that will need to be developed around that. How do we brand our content? Uh, how do we how do we protect it and make sure that it stays in contact? How do we make sure it's easy for people to get back to your authoritative source? There's lots of thinking to do. Not a finished product, but we're starting to think now, how do we put the structural pieces in place that allow that to happen? Design consistency. Up till now, um, it would be true to say that most sites think that it's better to be unique and special. Um, we really had a job ahead of us, convincing people that consistency is key. And I don't just mean in what colours you're using and typeface, uh, but also in where, where your buttons and, and call to actions are placed on a page, uh, what we call the buttons that we ask people to press, uh, that kind of consistency. We started working 
uh, towards that with the Australian Government Design System. And um, of course, I'm sure many of you saw that they uh, no longer in government. Uh, what you may not know is that GovCMS, a couple of government agencies and the DTA secretly sprinted for nearly six months to build the Australian Government Design System out to a state where it could be used and used by some rather large GovCMS sites. So we have a vested interest in it, we believe in it, and we've always supported it. And so we were, uh, you know, a little disappointed to see that and delighted, absolutely delighted at the civic theme, which is actually taking that work and taking it forward and truly open sourcing it and making it available to far more than the Australian government. Um, we in turn are fully committed to the civic theme and we will start to bring that more and more into GovCMS and we are you know, the basis of any white sites that we develop from now on. We'll be highly encouraging the community to take up more and more elements of that. And if you're not across that, please make sure you um, acquaint yourselves with something. Structural gaps. There's still lots of structural gaps. And where we can, we'll try and put some pieces in. Uh, rules engines, uh, lack of editorial control in the back end of this topic. These are things we might be able to do something about because we've got a really large community. Um, obviously, user journey mapping, there's quite a bit of that going on with the MyGov work at the moment, but it does centre uh, somewhat around transactions and those really high volume transactions. There's the need for that to go further and cover um, business and, and, and lots of um, cross journeys and cross jurisdictions. Uh, so that's it at the start. There's a long, long way to go on that. We can't do complex universe um, journeys until we've actually mapped them. Um, so here's some of the things that we have started working on to try and put those little bits in place for that vision that I've just outlined. The first one, personalisation, obviously, and we're right in the middle of that now. We've just uh, commissioned four proof of concepts and will now be, uh, we are within weeks of issuing the RFP and that, will, that RFP will go to people we've selected who went through that EOI process and uh, more than four. So the four, the four, four were selected for POPs but there's a bigger group that will be invited to respond to the RFP and the idea is at the end of that, hopefully by the end of the year or very early next year, we will have DXP um, available to all of our agencies as a separate and new section under the Digital Services Panel. <coughs> so in other words, it makes it much easier to procure. Um, so I'm putting a line in the sand and saying we're moving now rapidly into much greater sophistication and to enabling um, a much wider set of tools of governance. Rules of code. Um, the, the GovCMS community in the showcase was extremely excited about this. You've ever heard Peter Andrews talk about it, you can Google her, she's written a lot about it, spoke a lot about it, you know, Peter and I have a relationship that's <laughs> a working relationship that's gone on for years, um, and uh, I think it's time for this. And during the POC, um, you know, the showcase uh, that was done on Rules of Code was really exciting and solved an awful lot of problems for people in government. So watch this space. <laughs> single sign-on. We've, we've started working on single sign-on. You know, all the things that we need to know from managing it. Um, we have a partner, an agency, who's really, really keen to be the first one on uh, the blocks, and Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> is leading that work on single sign-on for us, so we're progressing with that this year. APIs. Well, I think we've got a manageable amount of APIs at the moment. What do you reckon? So it's fairly manageable, you know, it's not enormous, but we think there's going to be an explosion. We think there's going to be a big um, movement towards headless. We think that the XP tools are all going to require API connections. Uh, we just see it as a big growth area. So what do we need to be thinking about? How are we going to govern and protect those APIs and the endpoints? 
and Joseph leaving that bit of work too. He's <laughs> pretty busy. That's fine. Civic theme I already touched on and content anywhere. And, and yeah, I'll be taking a particular interest in that one to make sure real things happen. It is the year of procurement. So you for community. So this is my commitment. Um, we are still utterly committed to open source first. Nothing's changed. And the reason nothing's changed is because all the vision we had for GovCMS about being able for agencies and digital teams and governments to be able to share and reuse and to share the burden of development and to do things together and share the load, that's only possible because we're on open source. Now, it's fundamental to the cultural change we've brought to digital in the federal government and in some of the states and territories as well. We'll not back away from that. And Drupal, all the reasons I picked Drupal for in the first place. One, how much skill set was in the community? Could we purchase skills, Drupal skills in the community if we needed them? Um, how big was that community? Those are the reasons I selected Drupal over Joomla or anything else at the time, or WordPress. Um, and has that changed? It's changed because the Drupal community now is even more mature in terms of enterprise delivery, and it's even bigger, and it's even stronger. So all the reasons I picked Drupal haven't changed, they've got stronger. So I can tell you there'll be no change in Drupal. If I ever think it's getting that way, I would warn you. <laughs> you see these numbers on the website? I just want to make sure you know what they mean. This one here is not our pipeline. Anybody who thought that's our pipeline? Our pipeline is normally around 200 to 600. Um, this means there's 57 agencies who have signed an MOU with us and have actively begun development and have a projected date to come onto the platform. That's what that 57 means. It doesn't mean all the people knocking on the door, all the people having conversations with us, all the people telling us what's coming for them and when they're going to be bringing the ship on to it. So anytime you want to know what your pipeline is going to do for the that's the active pipeline, the committed pipeline. And to make sure everyone understands that. So, this was our establishment phase. Started with that here, and here. We went for another transformation here, going to Kubernetes, and our partnership with Solstice and Amazing. We're now at this point here. We're now starting our next transformation, and it's going to be all about personalization and content and consistency and all of it, and another level of sophistication again. What does it mean for you? Um, you're going to have another busy year. Post election, a lot of sites are retired, um, and then another whole bunch of sites is created. So, expect a busy year. Agencies are going to need help. They're going to need help with all the things that you normally do for them. Um, but they're also going to need help on the Drupal side, deep speed, integrations, um, rules as code. They're going to need help with SSO integration. So if you don't have much experience in that's where a good place to start investing in some skill in your, um, in your digital agencies. More agencies plan to build on headless, so if you've not been doing too much of that, again, another place to invest um, your team's skills, and your own skills if you're developer sitting in the room here. Um, and there will be work for content specialists and designers. Um, when we start influencing around design consistency and appropriate types of content that can be reused, they're going to need to see persistence around these things as well. So I think there'll be no shortage. Um, and while I just want to thank again everybody in the digital community, a lot of people in this room, um, 
it was uh, it's been an amazing two and a half years, terrifying at times, um, a privilege, but also we haven't felt alone and we've known that there's a whole community that we can reach out to and we have reached out to different people at different times. Um, we build on your work and make the most of what you have made possible. So once again, thank you, and I must say it has, it's, it's delightful to be here and to see you all in person and to my day of Drupal Sprint tomorrow. And my team is all participating except me because I've got to work. And that's it. Thank you very much.